This ain't a good morning. This ain't a good morning for y'all. Woo! Try that again. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, crossover family. I see you, brother. Yes. We're here to lift up the name of Jesus and bring him our best praise, our best worship, all that we are. And we're just going to say every praise belongs to who? Belongs to God. Here we go. Here we go. Hey. Every praise, every praise. Every prayer. 
worship with one of
so 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 good you are so good you are so good your goodness oh it's your goodness and your mercy it's your goodness and your mercy that you allow to follow us <laughs> every day of our lives I hear you David I hear you yes God hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus Anybody know that God has been good to you in spite of you, in spite of what we do? He's still a good God and still protects you and takes care of you. What kind of God is that that we serve? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys help us sing the song. Here we go. Lord, you are good, you've been so good, Lord, you are good, you've been better than good, I can praise you with Oh, you my life, oh, you my life, I can praise you with Even if I try, even if I try. Take it up, here we go. 
doors you've opened yeah. So many places you've made So many times you've healed me God, you've been better than good to me So many doors you've opened So many places you've made So many times Come you've on, healed Des. me God, you've been better than good to me so many ways, so many ways you've so been. many times, so many times you healed me. You've been better than good to me. You've been better than good so to me. So many times you've so opened. Many ways. So many ways you've made. So many times yeah. you've healed me. You've so been better than good many doors. So many doors you've opened. So many ways. So So good to me. You're always so good to me. Always so good to me. Even when I mess up day after day, your love still covers me. Ooh, when I find myself in the crazy, strangest places, your blood still covers me. Yes. Oh, your blood covers me. Cause you're such a good God. Such a wonderful God. Such a mighty God right here. Oh, you've been, you've been so good. So good. And you have been, you've been oh, so good. So good. You are always, you've been so good. So good to me. Women of Purpose are back with their next virtual event entitled Queen Fix Your Crown Financially. This event is June 25th at 7 p.m. And our guest speaker is Pastor Deborah Love. She's coming to share with us her passion, expertise, and strategies for financial planning. 
Don't miss a chance to connect and grow through this virtual event. For more information, email Deacon April Frazier at WOPCrossover at gmail.com. The Single Moms Outreach drive through Baby Shower and Diaper Giveaway was a huge success. This year, we were able to be a blessing to 52 moms in Hyattsville and the surrounding communities. Crossover family, we couldn't have done it without you. Because of you, we were able to bless them with gift bags full of diapers, bottles, clothing, just to name a few items. You met the need through donations to help us meet our goal. Not only that, but we had volunteers who helped us prepare our gift bags and showed up to serve these moms. And for that, we thank you. And finally, to leave a lasting impression, each mom was given a beautifully written prayer of thanksgiving in English and Spanish to support them and remind them of the love of God. What better way for us to carry out the mission of changing lives, changing families, and changing the world? Hey, Crossover Church. As you can see, I'm back on everybody's favorite orange sofa. And this is not to say that the virtual hug is happening at this moment, but it is coming soon. And I want to remind you that we are building a culture of clarity. And the only way that we get after clarity is by asking questions. So when you find yourself meditating on God's word, reading your Bible or hearing the Sunday sermon, we want you to jot down questions, things that seem unclear to you. And when you get to those moments, we want you to send them in either via email or in our question box that we have in the lobby. Because those questions, those comments begin to populate what we do on the virtual hug. And again, the virtual hug cannot be possible without you. So we need those questions. Okay, the virtual hug is coming soon and I can't wait to receive all of your questions. See you soon. Amen, saints. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. We're going to celebrate communion in just a minute. We have a pr the privilege of being obedient to what Jesus says. You know, there, there are some things that, um, for instance, like baptism and communion that don't make you saved, but because you're saved, guess what? We're obedient and we do it. Amen? Amen. So as, as you prepare your elements, if, every, if, if you don't have your elements in the house, lift up your hand and, uh, and the ushers can help you. Online, you can take a minute to gather your elements, your juice, your bread, and, and we're going to celebrate communion together. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to read some text, but how many of you... How many of you are preachers in the house today? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Guess what? We are all preachers. We are all conveyors of the Word of God. You know, we, we want to put the onus on pastor or the ministers, but guess what? Our job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, okay? That was just an aside, okay? Let's, let's, uh, let's move on. But we are all preachers, and actually, the, the, in the taking of communion, we are proclaiming the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. So, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 23 to 26, I'm going to start at verse 26 and then go back. But it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim you preach the Lord's death until he comes. So this, this taking of communion is, a, is, a, is an example of what God has done for us in Christ. So as we take our bread, I want you just to hold it up before the Lord right now. And I only have two hands, so I got to do some manipulating here. So, but but you all go ahead. The Apostle Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this 
is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take our bread and hold it up before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, the privilege of sharing in your broken body. Father God, we thank you that you gave your only begotten son that we could have eternal life and that by the stripes that Jesus took on that on, on the cross by the nail-pierced hands. We are healed, Lord God. We thank you. And Father, as we take this, we proclaim the death, the, re the death and the resurrection of Christ even now. So let's eat together. Amen. And it says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take our cup and hold it up before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other fount I know but the blood of Jesus. And as we take of this cup, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. That every sin we have committed, every sin that we could commit in the future has all been washed away. And it's just by faith, by taking hold of the, 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 the gift of, of this sacrifice that we could have eternal life. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We honor you as we drink. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Yes, God. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we're standing right here. Only because you made, oh, you made a way. If you know it, help me sing it. When my back was against the wall, and it looked as if it was over, you made a way. Now we're standing here, and we're standing.
you, God. Jesus. Thank you, God. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. We worship you. Jesus. Hallelujah. So grateful this morning. Thank you, God. Glory to God. And I'm standing here today because he made a way. He made a way. He is a way maker. And he made a way for you and he made a way for me. Amen. Well, let me let you know, we just had an awesome service on our Southside campus this morning. Amen. And I was thrilled to get here for what God was going to do in our gathering today. Take a moment, lift your hands before the Lord. Father, we thank you because your loving kindness is better than life. Our lips will praise you, thus will we bless you, and we lift up our hands in your name. So, Father, we lift our hands up. As we elevate your name above our name, we can't do anything without you. Matter of fact, our name has dignity because of your name. So, Father, be blessed in our time. Meet us as we look into your word. Change us where you want us to go. Give us grace and purpose to embrace your mind today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. Well, today we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to turn our attention to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And it says in verse 1, When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter, and our tongues with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. We see in this psalm that the psalmist is speaking about something that happened within the context of the history of God's people. This message is entitled, Welcome Back. (laughs) John Sebastian wrote a song a number of years ago, and it was the theme song of a well-known show entitled, Welcome Back, Carter. Matter of fact, they're using it for commercials even now. So maybe you've heard it recently. You remember how it goes? Welcome back. Your dreams were your ticket out. Welcome back to that same old place. Though the names have changed since you hung around and the dreams remain, but they turned around. Who, right, back here where we need ya. Well, we tease him a lot, but we got him on the spot. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Amen. Well, there, <laughs> there's a phrase in that song that says, your dreams were your ticket out. And for the nation of Israel in this season of time, that was a living reality as they found themselves struggling and dealing with the limitations of their new extended normal called Babylonian captivity. And so they would find themselves in a season in which they had to deal with the consequences of some actions. And the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 29 speaks to them in real time. And he says in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, It says this in verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when the 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So he's saying after 70 years of captivity, after 70 years of of bondage to another nation, I'm going to bring you back to your homeland. Wow, what a word to get when you know it's going to be fulfilled 70 years later. But the reality is God is saying, although you have gone through this and going through this, I will not forget you. Now, it's in this that they would 
find themselves at this critical moment. And you got to ask the question, how do you get to a place where God puts on you a judgment that will last 70 years? What, what did you do? And it's because the nation had turned away from the living God. God's people had turned away from reliance and trust upon him and began to find themselves saturated in the culture of other nations and worshiping other gods and going to the high places and rejecting the standards of God and living like the other nations. And God in his grace, because God is merciful and God is long-suffering, God will give us patience and, and he will deal with us in a way that, that is beyond human understanding how long God will give us an opportunity to turn around. And he, he's giving them opportunity. He sends prophetic voices to come and, and say, repent, turn around, change your mind, get back on board. But we would see something among the nations and we would see something that would happen in Israel that they would not turn to the Lord. They would not stay on board with God. And God, in his mercy, in his patience, has to say, enough is enough. Judgment is coming your way. And they would have to face 70 years of captivity. And they would be in Babylon facing the consequences of their sin. But God says, I'm going to be, I haven't forgotten you, and I won't forget you. And in verse 11 of that same chapter, it says this. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, it's interesting because I would quote that verse and I would get the last part wrong. I would say a hope and a future, but it's a future and a hope. God is saying something in this moment. God is saying, I'm going to give you hope for your future and I'm going to give you a future to exercise your hope. I'm going to be with you in the face of all that you're going through, and you're going to have vision as you're going through it. That's the presence and might of Almighty God. But how many know a lot can happen in 70 years? Think about it. A lot can happen in 70 years. A lot has happened in your lifespan. 20, 30, 40, 50 years. A lot has happened. We've seen a lot happen in those years. Imagine 70 years. Imagine now being taken into captivity. And what can happen in 70 years? Babies can be born in 70 years. And those babies can now be 40, 50, 60 years old, having been in captivity for so long. Babies that are born who have never experienced their own homeland who never lived in Canaan, the land of promise. All they know is Babylon. So you got babies that are born in that land. And we know that because Jeremiah charged them to get married, to move on with their lives, to build their houses, because they needed to prepare to enlarge their families, because there is coming a point when God was going to turn it around. Amen. And so here they are. They, these babies are being born in captivity. So you got that group of people being born that have never been in their homeland. And then in 70 years, how many know, 70 years, people can die. Die in 70. Imagine if you come into captivity and you're 30 or 40 or 50. It's a good possibility after 70 years, you're not making it back. So you'll never be able to experience what was promised. So you got two groups of people, those who were born in captivity who never saw the land of their history, the land of God's faithfulness and promise on their lives. Then you got those who would die in captivity and never make it back to the land. But in between those two groups, you got another group of people who would find themselves at a place where they would be fixed within the limits of their captivity and most likely find themselves striving and fighting and living within a survival mentality. Now, you think when you're going through a difficult situation, a survival mentality is good. You, you mean it helps you to deal with, to maintain, no matter what happens in the situation, you're fighting for that moment. But after years and years of being in a survival mentality, a survival mentality can be counterproductive. Because a survival mentality is about being able to deal with what is. And as you deal with what is, you can lose vision for what can be. And so you get stuck in surviving rather than projecting something greater for you in the future. 
And you see a people now who are at a place that are contending with these things. And, and here the psalmist says, when the Lord brought back, he brought back these captive ones of Zion. He said, it was like we were like those in a dream. When the Lord brought back, now when the Lord brought back, he was saying that God has, in essence, there's come a point where things were happening, changing the very moment of their experience in captivity, where God was freeing them to go back home. In the Hebrew understanding of this idea, that the God is saying this, that God is saying, I am turning a turn. Now, you say, wait, turning a turn. When the Lord brought back, he's turning a turn. We've all had experiences in our life where maybe things have gone peaceful, they've been well, maybe they've been financially well, you had financial order, things you were able to take care of, all your bills, things were going well financially for you. Maybe relationally things were going well, things well in your marriage, well with your, your family, well with your parental experiences, everybody seems to be doing good. You ever had moments like that? Or moments where things were going well in your health. You were doing good physically, you, you were healthy, you could eat whatever you wanted to eat. And so you were enjoying those moments, and then it turned. Something turned. Something broke out in your financial world. Bills came that you didn't expect. Something dropped. Something turned, and now you have to contend with the struggles of financial order, trying to get things back together. Or, find, or you may find yourself relationally. Things broke out in your marriage. You go, where did that come from? You ever, any married people ask, ever ask that question? Where did that come from? All of a sudden, something came up, and now it seems to be bigger than life. And, and you find yourself contending. Or either in your parental relationship with your kids, things have turned. Or how about your health? You were doing well, and then all of a sudden, one day, something happens. Something, you, something changes. And it affects the way in which you do life. There was a turn. Well, what the Lord is saying, when it says the Lord brought back the captive ones, it was saying this. God is saying, I am turning the turn. Yes. Uh, what was indeed a bad season in your life, I'm turning it and things are going to be good now. Yes. When the Lord brought back the captive ones, he was turning the turn. And we see here, he brought back the captive ones. It says, of Zion. Didn't say in Zion, but of Zion. You know, it's possible to be of Zion when you're not even in Zion. It's possible that you can find, because Zion represents your identity. It's possible to be in a place that doesn't represent your identity, but you still possess your identity, because your identity is not based on where you are. It's based on who you are. So I can be at a bad place and still be in Zion. I, I can be out of the land of my purpose and promise, but still have the land of my purpose and promise inside of me. Here they are, and they are of Zion. And they said this, when the Lord turned the turn, when the Lord changed things, he, they said it was like we were like those in a dream. It, it, it was like a dream. It was amazing. How many know that many times when you say it was like a dream, you're saying it was too good to be true. But because of the origin of this, it was true. God indeed was bringing his people back home. And in that moment, and how many know dreams can be exciting, they can be challenging, they can be all that, but this was reality. And it was so amazing because they found themselves in this moment. And I think the reason that it felt like a dream, because there comes those moments when we're believing God for something. Anybody had a season of time where you were believing God specifically for something? Amen. And those, those moments in which you're believing God for something and what happens, you pray about it. And the next day you look for it and it's not there. And, and the next week it's not there. And the next month, it's not there. You've been praying for it, expecting. You've been believing your, your belief level is this high. But what happens over time, you can find yourself emotionally detaching yourself from your belief. You find yourself stepping away emotionally to some degree because now to keep on keeping your belief and your emotional anticipation at the same level can be painful. 
because it's painful to wake up and have an expectation for it to happen and it doesn't happen. It's not that you stop believing, but you have emotionally disgaged yourself. You're mostly disconnected yourself from what you're believing. And sometimes when we go through those things, we, we kind of just block it out of our mind. We go, okay, I just got to do life as normal. I just gotta. And what happens, we emotionally detach from the idea of what we are believing God for. Because we, we say it's painful to have that same anticipation and not see it manifested in our life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so we can find ourselves in those moments, in those seasons. And in those moments, in those seasons, I would imagine that group in the middle, not necessarily the ones who were born in, not, of course not the ones who have died, but those who found themselves in that survival mentality when the Lord turned this thing, when he turned it and released them, that they found themselves at a place that it was so, uh, so overwhelming that those internal canals, the emotional canals burst wide open and they just begin to laugh and they begin to shout with joy because they were thrilled because there's a connection between what they were believing God for and what they were seeing with their eyes. And they just rejoiced and celebrated the goodness of the Lord. What an awesome reality. Now, you know, I love this about the ancient Jewish people. The ancient Jewish, ancient, uh, ancient Jewish people were people who were emotionally expressive. They wore their feelings on their sleeve, on their face. It was obvious. If they were going through something, <laughs> you knew it. If it was a hardship, it, it was conveyed in their face and how they convey, talked. If somebody died, they wailed, they mourned. It was expressive. They were an expressive people. If things were going good, they rejoiced, they celebrated, they danced, they, they leaped, they shouted. They were in a, a group that expressed their emotions. It's all right to express your emotions. It's all right. It's like when somebody loses a loved one and we say, don't cry. Why are you saying that? Well, come on, cry. It's all right. That means something meaningful has been taken out of your life. It's all right to feel the pain. It's all right to express that. And when something good goes your way, you want to rejoice in it. You want to celebrate it. But how many know emotions are a good thing? How many know emotions could be a bad thing? Because emotions can take us on a trip that we don't need to go. Because emotions don't have an intelligence. Emotions are just feel-based. They're reacting to something. And they can take us, they can take us and move us and, and guide us. And isn't he wondered then the psalmist says, in essence, we got to grab our emotions. He says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it thereof and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. What is he saying? He's saying, no matter what you go through, even in your hardship, difficult times, it's all right Find a moment to recognize beyond what you go through, God is still worthy of praise. God is still worthy of glory. And no matter of fact, the fact that you are experiencing the pain and are alive to experience the pain is a statement of the goodness of God. You are still here and God's blessings are still accessible to your life. Hallelujah. That's why we can bless him in the face of difficulty. That's why we can consider it all joy, my brother, when you go in various trials. Well, God is in the midst. He's working things. He's turning the turn. Here, it's in those moments that they just begin to laugh. Ask somebody, when's the last time you had a good laugh? I mean, the kind of laugh where you didn't think about anybody else around you. You were just laughing. You probably snorted a little bit. And... <laughs> See, I can cry. When I cry, I can cry over with, in pain. I can cry in sorrow. I can cry in loss. But I mean, no, I can cry in joy. I can cry when good things happen. I, I can cry when, when miraculous things, I can cry holding a, a newborn baby. I can cry at all those wonderful things. That, that those, I can cry in good times, I can cry in bad times. But when it comes to laughter, when it comes to a belly laugh, for us who may have a belly, <laughs> or a six-pack laugh, I don't know. But, but it, it, what happens, that comes from a place of happiness. 
Something good has happened. Or you heard something good or something made you feel good and you begin to laugh. They were laughing. They were so excited. They were so thrilled. It was so intense that it said the other nations could recognize and hear their celebration. And they said, the Lord has been good to them. Wow. The Lord has been good. That's like you being in your house and you just begin to laugh and sing and shout to the Lord. And your neighbor says, something is happening over there. Something is happening. So they said, look, the Lord's been good to us. And we got to declare the Lord's been good to us. And we are glad about it. Amen. The Lord's been good to us. So everything is going good. They've restored to their homeland. Things are falling in place. They've been released after 70 years of captivity. Then we get to verse 4. And verse 4 says this. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes forth, goes to and fro, weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Guys, you remember that? Bringing in the sheaves. We will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Okay, the two or three people who sung with me, I want to say to everybody else, that's a hymn, right? It's a part of a hymn. (laughs) I know that goes back a little bit. Minister Kim taught me that before service. But here we see that they are, that the psalmist here is saying, restore our captivity. The New International Version says, restore our fortune. In other words, restore the prosperity, restore the blessing and the favor we experienced when we were in the land before captivity. Restore us to that place. Give it back to us. Because now they were coming out of this fact that they were feeling like they were in a dream. It was so good. It was so good. But I may know dreams can feel so realistic. And I'm talking about actual dreams, night dreams, daydreams. They can feel so realistic. You can find yourself in a dream. I've had dreams that were so realistic that when I woke up, I said, thank you, Lord, that that wasn't real. Because I was tangled in a tangle and caught up in a mess. I said, and I woke up and I said, "Woo! thank the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because <laughs> dreams can be like that. Dreams can work you. Dreams can, can begin to take you. I, funny, I had a dream just recently where I was, I was in the dream and I was on my way to church to preach. Right? And two of my teeth fell out. <laughs> and I thought, what am I going to do? So I called the dentist and the dentist said, I'll see you. And I went to the dentist and the dentist put my two teeth back in. This is all before going to church. Isn't that amazing? Right? I got to church with my teeth back in and nobody knew the difference. One thing I've discussed. Yeah, praise the Lord. (laughs) Wait a minute, it could be real. Let me see. (laughs) Dreams give us a chapter, but dreams don't give us the whole story. It doesn't give us the whole book. And here they are. It was like a dream. It felt like a dream when they were being delivered out of bondage. But once they got to their homeland, the dream turned to a nightmare. Because, see, when they left out of bondage, they were heading to the place, the place they had come from, the place that they owned, the place they possessed. They were excited. It was wonderful. But once they got there, they got to a place that was destroyed, was torn apart by their enemies, the temples, the houses, everything were, was ripped up by their enemies. So when they got back there, they were coming back to a place where they had to rebuild and reestablish their lives. And we get pictures of this, like in, in the book of Nehemiah, you get a picture of this. When they come back, they got to rebuild the wall and they had to face opposition and attacks in, in the face of all this. In other words, they had to work and put their hands. They've been working and slaving uh, for 70 years. They get delivered and now they got to work. And they said, restore our fortune, oh God. Restore our fortune. I love it. And Eugene Peterson's a message. He says this. He says, do it again. What you've done before, do it again. See, that brings us to this fact that this section of Scripture points to a reality. It's it's a prayer with a prophetic promise. 
It's, it's the psalmist crying out. It's speaking to a truth. There are things that we need God to do. Yeah. Ain't no need for us to try to do them. We can't do them. There are things we need God to do. Yeah. And there are things God needs us to do. And the working relationship between the two has everything to do with the manifestation of a harvest in our lives. So here, there are things we need God to do. He says, as the streams, as the streams flow from the south, the streams in the south, or the streams in the Negev, or the streams in the desert. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't connect the idea of a stream in a desert. A stream is a dry place. You don't think about a stream flowing in a desert. But how many know that God is a God of the impossible? And when it, in this area of the, of the Southland, in the desert, it hardly ever rained. It was a rarity. But if it did rain and they got an inch of rain, an inch was enough to produce a stream that could move with such force that it could begin to change the landscape. God, we need a stream. We need something to come in and change the landscape of our present circumstance. We need you to do it again. We need you just as you delivered us from our bondage. Now deliver us from our devastation. God, we need you to show up and manifest yourself in this dry place. How many know that it's possible to be in a new season on the outside and be dry on the inside? It's possible to be at a new place and return to the place of promise and calling and at the same time be dry as the desert. It's possible to now be back in Zion and still have Babylon inside of you. Zion, that idea, that, that word Zion means monument or the place of elevation. It speaks to the issue of, of being raised up. Zion is elevation, but Babylon, Babylon means mixture or confusion. Imagine God is raising you up. God is giving you an opportunity to step back into something fresh. You get there, but there's still confusion inside of you. And there's mixture. What's the mixture between belief and unbelief? Between obedience and disobedience all inside of you, even though God has given you a fresh new opportunity. Here they are and they're saying, God, God, we need a stream. We need something fresh to happen. We are at a dry place, but understand, this is the cry. The cry is, God, send a flash flood of revival. Send a flash flood of revival because something can happen in your season of dryness that you can find yourself getting used to that you need a fresh encounter with a living God. You need God to show up and bring something into your life that you have made a disconnect with. And so he's saying, look, fresh refreshes, do it again, do it again, do it again. Now, so we know only God can send a flood, can send a stream to make it move in an awesome way in the desert. But what, what do we do? What does God need from us? Well, God needs from us, as we look at the second half of that, that psalm in the bottom part, it says this, those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him, bringing his harvest with him. What is he saying? He's saying this, that when we come to this place, in order for us to embrace the fullness of what God can do, what we need to do is we need to sow into what God expects so we can reap what God can perform. I'm going to say it again. So we need to sow into what God expects so we can reap in terms of what God can perform. Now, I know sometimes when we hear the term sowing and reaping, it's, it's applied to the issue of financial uh, responsiveness toward God, and that's true. I mean, the reality, of we got to be faithful and honoring God and the tithe, the offering, all those things. That's great, and that's, that's a beautiful concept, but that's not the reality of solely what's being said here. When we talk about the idea of sowing here, and even says with tears that we're sowing here, we're sowing our faith. We're sowing our obedience. 
We're sowing our trust. We're sowing our endurance in God. We're sowing our pursuit of the living God. Remember, we declared something. We understood something. Faith owns it. Hope can see it. Trust acts like it is true, and endurance won't let it go. We got to sow that before the Lord. Sow our faith, sow our expectation. If we begin to sow what God expects of us, we can reap what God can perform for us. But we got to work with God. I say you got to work with God. How many know that when they begin to get their seed and sow their seed, that their seed that they had didn't come from Lowe's or Home Depot? How did they get to their homeland with seed? Well, obviously, they had to bring seed from somewhere. Maybe the seed came from Babylon, from all that, and they were able to take seed with them that they could sow into their homeland. But the the thing is, if I sow my seed, I need a harvest. Because if I sow my seed and I don't get rain and I don't get the streams flowing, then I will lose my seed and I'll have nothing left. And I'll have no seed, I'll have no produce, I'll have no no food, I'll be wiped out. That means I've got to trust God with my seed. That means I've got to believe that God can do something even in a dry place. Oh, I hope you get this. That God can do something. And isn't it interesting that God many times will call us to a place of obedience and faith in a dry place? When we don't see any other options, we don't see other things, we don't see this working, we don't see that working, we can't fix it. But God says, now I want you to sow. Sow faith, sow trust, sow belief, because something can happen. Just as we talked about having an emotional disconnect from the things we're believing, it's possible to have an attachment to your dry place. Mm Mm-hmm. It's possible to have an attachment to your dry place because what happened in your dry place was the place that you were able to maximize your convenience. It was the place where you did what you want to do when you want to do it. It was a place without accountability. It was the place that you were able to set up things and go your own way and fix things how you want to go and establish things. And, and it was about exercising your mind and your approach to life. And, and, and But then when God says, I need you to sow obedience and trust, now he's bringing order back in. He's calling you to a place of service. Now it's time to rebuild the walls. God is not saying, let everybody else rebuild the walls and you sit there and watch. And you reap the benefits of them rebuilding the walls. No, it's now everybody. That means you got to lay down your convenience and sow your obedience. You got to sow your servitude. It was so interesting. A few weeks ago, I talked about the issue of the importance of community and how we need community to help us and how we saw the manifestation, even in some of the roughest times in this past year, that we had services, funeral services, people who had lost loved ones. And the ability to have those services is because people in this church served as community to come out, ushers and different people served those families so they could have a meaningful time in remembering and celebrating the lives of their loved ones. That was community. Well, you know, we all need community. But you know what's so important? How can we come to a place of just needing community without being community? That means somebody's going to need us. Somebody's going to need us to, to take our hands and put them to the plow and help rebuild the walls. We're in a new season. And it's a time to rebuild. It's time to sow. It's time to give ourselves. And so it's hard to let go of the dry place. Oh, it's been so good. I could relax. I could do this. I could watch other people do audio and and watch other people do TV ministry and usher and serve. And I could sit there and enjoy the, the service and eat breakfast. Oh, that's good. Mmm. Yeah. Bring it. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. All right. I'll tune back in next week. But wait a minute. The people who serve you also need to be served by you. The people who bless you need to be blessed by you. How can you bless the people who serve you? You join hands with them. You help them carry the weight. 
That's the call. We got to rebuild the wall together. And so if I look at losing my seed in a dry time, understand if I do it in faith, I understand this. I lose my seed in a dry place. I'm not losing my seed because on the other side of my seed is a harvest. Is the blessings of almighty God. If I will do what God says, I can anticipate the manifestation of the blessing and the harvest of God on my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Tell somebody it's a new season. And it's harvest time. And we're going to bring in the sheaves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bring in in the sheaves, bringing in the manifestation. I think we have yet to see what God is releasing in this new season after this past year. What God was to produce in and through you. I believe eyes have not seen and ears not have not heard. We, I believe, are stepping into a moment of incredible encounters and releases in the presence and the spirit of God. But it's going to take you sowing your belief, Amen. your faith, your trust, your obedience to God. Come on, stand with me. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 If we can just for a moment, just sing this chorus. Uh, as Minister Kim comes. <laughs> Amen like a mighty rushing wind. <laughs> Would you declare this? You made a way When my back was against the wall And it looked as if it was over you made a way now we're standing here only because you made. Come on, sing with me. You made a way. When my back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over, you made a way. Now we're standing here only because you made a way. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands and on our hands give God praise for the word of the Lord? Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but why don't you just take a step and say, I'm stepping in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for the word of the yes, Lord yes, through our lead pastor. Amen. We are so grateful this afternoon. Maybe you're visiting with us. We are grateful for your visiting, whether it's your first, second, or third time. We are grateful. Church online, if you're visiting for the first time, we're grateful to have you. Amen. It's at this point in the service that is such a blessing because, you know, the meal is prepared with the Word of God, but it becomes an opportunity that if we're standing on the other side of the table and we've never yet surrendered our heart to God, then you have that opportunity this morning as our connection counselors are coming on down front. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity to surrender your heart. The scripture says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, amen, then we shall be saved. So church online, if you've never given your heart to God, here's an opportunity for you. We have connection counselors online as well. If you type it in the chat, we'd love to help you in your journey in this belief with God, amen. Also, it is a good thing to honor the Lord with the tithe, offering, and building fund. How many know that everything we have is because we serve a good, good God, a good, good Father who meets all of our needs according to his riches and glory? 
in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we talk about honoring the Lord and you leave here this afternoon, the ushers are ready to receive your gifts. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands again before God. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that this is the day that you have made. We thank you for the word that we have heard and received this morning. God, let it fall on good soil in our hearts today, Father. Let us take action with the points that we received and the notes that we took, God. Let us be doers of your word so that we will not be forgetful hearers, oh God. Father, we thank you, God, for those who are in the room and those who are online and you're knocking on the door of their heart, God. Father, you're knocking on the door and you're inviting them into a relationship with you, God. Let faith arise in this room. Let faith arise online, dear God, that hearts would be yielded and surrendered to you today because you love us so much, God, and you have an incredible plan for your people, Lord God. So we thank you, God, as our connection counselors are here, Lord God ready to help and assist, oh God. And Father, we thank you for those that may be in the room and maybe they have been visiting us for a little bit of time, but you're knocking on their hearts to become partners in ministry, to become members, Lord God, with Crossover Church. We say let faith arise in their hearts as well, God, and that, God, they would come to this altar. We're excited to welcome them into this household of faith, God. Father, we thank you for your blessings, God, as we extend our hands. And as we honor you, God, with the tithe, offering, and building fund, Father, it comes from hearts that are trusting you, God. Father, because you've been so good to us, and we know that anything that we have, God, it is because of who you are, God, and what you have entrusted into our care, God. So bless us, oh God, as we return to you what you have given unto us. And as we go into this week of service, we simply ask you, do it again, God. <laughs> Do it again in our lives, oh God. Do it again, oh God, as we've heard and received your word, God. Father, we anticipate for you to do in us and through us what only you can do. And because we love you, we're going to give you a shout of praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah!